Wow. <laughs> there are too many of you uh, to make eye contact with right now. We might be here the whole night in silence uh, if I tried. Um, I kind of do want to try, but I won't put you through it. Um, but sometimes I do wonder. Can you hear me okay? Sometimes I do wonder if at um, a talk like this one, if I just remained silent the whole time, if that might actually be a more useful contribution um, to our collective uh, journey of understanding what listening is and might be and what it might do for us and to us. Um, than any words I might be able to say if I just shut up and just <laughs> see where it went, you know, where would we go? Home. <laughs> interesting you say that. It's, it's an interesting point. Because there is a kind of home uh, that you that I uh, have gone to with another in silence and silence alone. There's a place that um, can't really be accessed with talk, 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 talk. And I think it's interesting that silence is such a rarity uh, in most of our lives. Why? What are we avo avoiding? It's, it's a relevant question to, to this journey that I'm going to um, talk to you about. Um, yeah, that all those miles have everything to do with silence and um, learning how to be with silence, which is to learn how to be with myself so that I might be able to be with you fully and completely as opposed to just my own projection of who you might be, you know? I want to know who you are. And the only way to find out is to listen. <laughs> it sounds so simple, you know? Um, but what I, what I learned over the course of um, dedicating myself to this practice of listening um, was that it's not as easy as it might sound, you know, especially when what you're hearing isn't something you agree with. What do you do then? Do you stop? Listening doesn't. Listening continues. You might stop. But listening, I found, um, is all-encompassing and all-inclusive, all-welcoming. Um, and that's what I was learning how to become while I was, while I was doing this. So we'll, we'll get into that maybe. Um, but let me give me, let me give me, let me give you some of the nitty gritty of this journey. Um, I graduated from college, uh, in 2011. And as, as Michael shared with you, I, I, I had this sense of like, okay, I graduated from all these years of, of education and I'm supposed to sort of know something about something. And, um, I don't even, know something about m myself is the way it felt. You know, I, I, had, I had been so well coached and trained and taught in, in lots of ways, um, but no one ever taught me who I was. Of course, no one could. It was a journey for, for me and for each of us to experience. But at the time, I thought that that was a big problem, you know, and so, before diving into a career of some sort, I wanted to take some time with this disturbing feeling that I wasn't sure who I was or where I was going, you know, rather than pretend it wasn't there and just start working as if there wasn't a question, because there was. And I had at first this idea that I would travel halfway around the world to go get my questions answered. And I would turn to um, the plan was to go to an indigenous community in West Africa and another in Peru and see about how they raise their young people into adulthood. 
figuring that I was left with so many ambiguities and questions and concerns given the way I was raised into adulthood in this culture. So many um, confusing models of manhood, disturbing models of manhood, um, and not just manhood, but adulthood, you know? What do we value? What do we prioritize? How are we there for our young people? How aren't we there? So I, I was sort of, I was of the most privileged few. And even still, with all of this love and support given to me by my family and teachers, I, was, I still felt unmoored, which maybe is inevitable, you know? Um, but I thought maybe if I go far away, I'll learn something new. And so I applied for a fellowship to go, to go pursue this project and, and didn't get it. And I was like, all right, I don't need the fellowship. I'm gonna go work on a lobster boat make a lot of money quick and have an adventure while I'm at it, you know, and then, and then go do the thing. So I got a job, um, not too far from here, actually in Marshfield. Um, and it was around the same time that I connected with Jay Allison, which is the reason why I'm here. Um, he gave me these boots, literally, <laughs> Um, the man taught me how to tell a story and um, welcomed me into his home when I had finished walking and had, had accumulated 85 hours of tape, interviews with people, and we sat down and started making a radio story out of it. And he, I got some boots out of the deal, too. It was sweet. Um, so, you know, thank you, Jay. And, uh, but it was in Marshfield, and um, so I, I start lobstering, and, and it's going great, and um, uh, just three months in, I get fired <laughs> from the boat, just kind of, and you'll have to read the book for that story. We're a little too close to Marshfield for me to go into that story right here to feel safe. And <laughs> no, he was a sweet man. Um, so then there was the question of, okay, I've got, I've got this urgency inside me, this, this longing to go meet myself, encounter myself, far away from what everyone else was telling me I am, far away from everything I know and am comfortable with. I, I, I have this longing and calling and urgency, but I don't have the money. I don't have the fellowship, you know, what to do. And, and then I, I thought, what if I just walked out mom's back door? What if I don't need to fly halfway around the world? What if I simply put on a perspective that viewed everything as my teacher, not just every person. I mean, that alone would be a big shift to shift into seeing you and you and you and you as my teacher. But everything, every moment, every moment of discomfort and loneliness and confusion and fear and doubt. And what if I just threw myself out there and, saw the world in this way? What if I just started walking to listen? And so I did, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't have any other ideas and the clock was ticking. I could feel my life happening and going by, you know, quick, get out the door. So I, I packed a backpack full of just basic necessities, camping gear, I had a tent, sleeping pad, sleeping bag, bag. Um, I had a food bag full of uh, just basic food. Um, I had a whole coffee operation, <laughs> you know, I was really concerned about the coffee, um, <laughs> which eventually I realized was ridiculous because I, I chose to walk on the highways the whole way because I wanted to meet as diverse a cross-section of people as possible as many different kinds of people, as many different kinds of perspectives and opinions and experiences and wisdom, which to me is just what you've lived with awareness, you know, as many different kinds of wisdom. And so walking the highways, I eventually realized I would have coffee available, okay? <laughs> it was, it was going to be okay. So eventually I jettisoned the coffee. Um, but yeah, that first day, <laughs> that first day, first days, huh? 
This one was uh, remarkable in the way that it radically stripped me to the bone, stripped me to my nakedness, which was what everyone, well, I can't speak for them, but the people I met, that's what they met on the road. They met someone who was in a state of deep vulnerability, who was, who, who wasn't afraid to ask, um, you know, most of the time, some of the time, I don't want to be too kind to myself, but um, was at least trying to ask questions that might reveal something about himself that might be hard to show, you know, questions like, what is happiness? I'm not sure anymore. How do you find out who you are? You know, how did you come of age? A, a sincere question that would reveal to you that I don't know all the answers, you know, this kind of vulnerability. And on top of that, dozens and then hundreds and then thousands of miles away from home, you know, and, and, and speaking about it in retrospect like this, it can, I don't know how it sounds. I'm, I'm hearing the words come out of my mouth. It can sound sort of like there's a kind of bravado to it or some bravery to it. In the experience of it, the experience of vulnerability, I mean, what is vulnerability like? Quivering, quaking. I mean, it can feel empowering. But when you're in it and naked, or when I am in it and naked in that way, ready to show you who I am, show you who I am. Um, it's, yeah. It was rare for me. It was a new experience for me. <laughs> and so that first day, I walk out my back door, and my mom walks me to these train tracks out back. And just a slow, trundling train would go by every, you know, twice a day or something. I shouldn't have walked on the train tracks. I know. Okay, all you grandmothers and mothers out there. It was just for the first two days. I didn't want to. The road is such, a, um, it, such an alien, hostile place if you're not in a car. And at the beginning, I was so um, af afraid, really, that I, I, I couldn't start on the road. So I started on the train tracks. Mom walked me out there, sent me off on my way. And she said she sensed some fear in me as I was walking away, some doubt you know, and she didn't want her son leaving for this great unknown with those seeds of doubt in him, is what she told me later. And so she said, as I'm walking away, she goes, lift up your arms. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, <laughs> which is the cover you see here. She took this picture then. And what I do think is funny is it's this moment of, of machismo, sort of like victory, right? You know, you see, this is what you see. Woo! What's happening is, oh my God! Ow! I, as soon as I lifted my arms up, it just started coming out. Yeah. And as a, as a young man, that was rare because I was trained to hide that kind of stuff. You know, I was trained and conditioned and told that that was a display of weakness, you know. And one of the consequences of choosing to set off into the unknown alone uh, was there was a lot of that. Oh, God. Oh. All of a sudden, there was so much space to feel things that I didn't have space to feel before. Thoughts to all of a sudden hear that had been getting thought and thunk without even realizing it. And all of a sudden I'm hearing because there's so much space and silence. A lot of tears. And that was good. I needed that. For me, that was a part of coming of age. Meeting all these parts of myself. Meeting them, learning how to be with them, be in relationship with them 
so that I can be in relationship fully with you. Because there is a way in which um, what I've been able to, to meet and encounter and understand in myself is, is proportional to my ability to tolerate and include and welcome whatever you have to give me. You know? And so there are some stories that I could speak to that maybe as we go here. But um, so yeah, I'm crying. Mile one. <laughs> it's going to be a long walk. <laughs> and not a mile down the tracks. I see this car pull up on the side of the road. And it was not my mother. <laughs> Although I'm sure she wanted to. She talks about how she was split in two over the course of this year. She said there was the divine mother that knew everything was in order. Was taken care of, it was fine. But then there was the animal mother. And she said the animal mother, she had to lock that one in the bathroom. <laughs> you know. Or else it would have been her on the road. <laughs> this car pulls up and you know, I'm like, okay, this is like first encounter. You know? Who who is it? And this guy gets out, and sure enough, he's coming towards me. He comes to the trees, toward the train tracks. And I'm thinking, this might be it. You know, this might be the guy, the teacher, the guru, the one who's going to answer my question for me. And maybe I won't have to, you know. <laughs> and out of the woods, he emerges. And as I get closer, I realize it's Bob, my mom's landlord. <laughs> And I'm thinking, Bob, Could, is it you, Bob? <laughs> Bob is a, a, a veteran of the police force in Philadelphia. And so he would always walk around with a very sort of solemn, I don't know if that's a direct result of being a police officer, but he would always just, you know. And, and you know, we'd see each other in the backyard and say, hey, go. You know. So he comes up and I go, Bob, and keep my, I'm wearing a huge backpack with an American flag, an earth flag, and a walking to listen sign and a cowboy hat for some reason. I don't I just thought that's what you do when you go off on a big journey. Wear a cowboy hat. So I look ridiculous in short. And Bob looks frightening as usual. And I go, what a, what a coincidence to see you out here, Bob. And he goes, it's not a coincidence. Your mom's a wreck back at the house. Okay. All right. He goes, you don't, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. And I'm thinking, Bob, I need a pep talk right now, man. <laughs> Come on. Pump me up, man. I was just sobbing a second ago. Good thing you didn't see that. <laughs> but on the one hand, he was right, you know, upon reflection. Um, I realized this, yeah, many years later, writing writing this book, the writing, a part of it I wrote in this uh, very building, actually, in the Lilly Library. I don't know if it's called that, but the stacks over there. And, and as I'm sort of like figuring and integrating and wondering about what this whole journey was, and I'm writing this scene, I realized that he was right. I didn't have to do this. And a part of me thought that I did. A part of me thought that I had to do something epic uh, in order to be... Um, worth something. That was another thing that I was taught. Not, you know, um, overtly necessarily, but it was something I absorbed somehow, something many young people are absorbing in the courses of their coming of ages. And this idea that you got to go, you got to go be something, which suggests who you are as you are now is not enough. You got to go do something. Which suggests if you don't, well, you were, you know. So it's 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 a it's a, it's a, it's an invisible, quiet conditioning that happens. This 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 thing of you're you're not enough, you know. And I thought I got to do, you know, I got to do something with this. I got to do. And Bob saying you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. And I think a function of any 
coming of age ritual worth its salt or however that phrase goes, uh, a part of the function of it is to uh, turn the young person around and um, give them an experience of how that's true, how they don't need to do anything to be worth. They don't have to be any way other than how they are and who they are in order to belong. It's you belong here and now you've gone through this experience and don't you know it? And this was a part of what happened to me over and over and over again on this journey. Time and time again, people, without even realizing that they were contributing to my coming of age in this way, some of them perhaps realizing, but without even realizing, welcoming me into their homes and saying, you belong here, buddy. Maybe not with those words, but just by the fact that they're attending to me, to this stranger. So you don't have to do this. But on the other hand, I did have to do it, you know, because I didn't know that or believe it myself. And it took this walk for me to begin believing. You know. And each of us have our own unique way of stumbling into this realization. You know. So I said, okay, Bobby, I don't have to do this. I'm, I'm going to, though. And um, he goes, well, it can be six months or it can be six hours. I said, okay. He goes, you got a knife? I said, yeah, I've got a knife. He goes, well, here's another one. <laughs> Gives me a big knife. And then he goes, don't trust anybody. <laughs> don't trust anybody. What would you have said? <laughs> don't trust anybody. Understandable. I mean, we've all read the news or reading the news. We know what we are capable of doing to one another. But we also forget what we're capable of. Or we forget that we also have hearts that are capable of compassion, of radical, ridiculous compassion. Each one of us, each one of us. <laughs> so yeah, don't trust anybody. I was like, Bob, how can I exp This is kind of the whole point, man. <laughs> like walking to listen, you know? I'm I got to trust. You know, if I if I don't if I don't trust them, how can I expect anyone to entrust me with their stories, their truth, their hearts? How unfair. Who if I don't take the first step, how could I expect them to? That's a big first step to take. And that's a scary first step to take, to trust. What are the costs you might have to pay if you, if you trust and then experience a betrayal of some kind? What are the costs you are paying right now by not trusting? There, that was something I began to realize once I began exploring what trust makes possible. Is my God, I had been... There is a cost to living without trust. So, but it's a, you know, a moment to moment, you know, how do I, how do I trust even the sound of that beautiful cell phone? <laughs> Truly, every part of every moment, that's how deep one can go with the practice of trust. I know, and I'm stumbling through it in this very moment, you know. Trusting that something's going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> See, where was I? <laughs> Don't trust anybody. So I continue on, and five or six miles later, um, I'm coming out of the outskirts of Kennett Square, the town near where my mom lives, and um, and there's an industrial district this way and some woods that way. And I see up ahead four men on the train tracks. And I'm far away from home now at this point to feel some fear. You know, and I come upon these guys and they're Latino men. And they look like they might be homeless, though I wasn't sure. 
and they give me a strange look, as was their right, given how I looked. <laughs> totally ridiculous. And I looked at them kind of like, you know, trying to trust, feeling all the... And he goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm walking across America. <laughs> right? <laughs> was I even allowed to say that at that point? I don't, you know, sounded ridiculous to me, but they didn't know that. I've just been just started this morning, you know, walking across. <laughs> it's legit. I've got a sign. See, showed him my sign. It's, I swear to God, I've got it laminated at Staples. It's for real. And he goes, huh? He says something to to the to the one guy in, in Spanish, and this other guy starts rustling around in a bin. And I'm thinking maybe it's time to go, you know, about to pull something out. And he pulls out a package of cookies and a sleeve of apple juice boxes. He says, here you go. <laughs> and I, I, all of a sudden, I'm transported into another world. You know, I'm just, where, where am I? And we sit down on the railroad ties, and Martine takes out a handle of vodka, starts passing it around, you know. I take out my mandolin, I'm playing a song. You know, and it was the it was my first taste of of the world that becomes possible with a willingness and an ability to listen. And what is listening? Opening, laying down your arms, and what are the arms? The need to know the need to be right, the need to win, the need to, you know, yeah, okay, that's cool, but like, but me, you know, laying down your arms, and let me just try listening. And all of a sudden, you're out on the railroad track sipping vodka and playing mandolin with Martin, you know what I mean? And Gabriel, and Sergio, and Pedro. My first angels on this journey. And all of a sudden, we looked off into the field, and there was this big cloud rolling in and sheets of rain. And we're like, oh my God. <sighs> Wash right over us, coming down. Three of them rush off. And before Martine rushes off, he goes, Come with me. We'll take you to our home. We'll get you out of the rain. And I'm feeling Bob's knife in my pocket. Don't trust anybody. Maybe good advice. I don't know. I'm also feeling the rain saturate my clothing. <laughs> Which again is a part of that vulnerability of you're out there. You're exposed to whatever comes by. And I'm thinking, right, this is why I'm here. You know, so I go. I follow him into the woods. And we end up in this clearing behind a strip mall I'd been to a million times before, you know, for lunch, Capriati's. And I had never known there was this whole other world just on the other side of the facade, you know. And each one of them had a hut made of wood pallets and tarps and like held together by bungee cords. And Martin invited me into his little home and asked me if I wanted dry clothes. And when I said, no, thank you, he took off his clothes and put on the dry clothes he was offering me. Thinking, what, what would you have done if I said yes? You know, wow, can you give me your clothes? We talk a little bit more, show, show each other pictures of our families, and, and then the rain stops. And we go outside to leave, and I'm sort of feeling like, I don't really want to go. Like, we've done something here. We've found something, created something. And like, maybe this is it, but there, no, there's more. But, ah, you know, just the ache of goodbye, which this was also, I mean, this, this journey was a, a practice in goodbye. You know, goodbye again. And, uh, and Martin shook my hand. He said, be careful out there. 
May God bless you. He said, always sleep with a knife by your side. <laughs> or a pistol. <laughs> I said, I think you and Bob might, I think you might dig each other, you know? You might not think so at first, but... And so it became this, this um, exploration of, of, uh, of walking and listening. And uh, this realization of um, just how little I actually knew. You know? And learning that from each person. Each person became a reservoir of, uh, of insight for me. And I gave them, what I was trying to do was give them the opportunity to um, step into the fullness of, of who they were, who they are, um, and see what they might find, see what we might find together in slowing down, in silence, in devotional attention. You know, the attention that says, I care for you. So much that there's nothing else I want to be doing right now. Nowhere else I'd rather be. And that kind of attention is so rare in this culture that when someone receives it sometimes, they don't even trust it. Because they're like, well, no, 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 what do you want from me? No, this, it can't just be that simple. You, there must be something you're trying to get out of this. And I was trying to get something out of it. Then. You know? I want to get you. I really want to get you. I want to understand you. I had an experience just last night. I mean, a part of what I'm doing now, the, this journey ended in 2012. And in the years since, I've been wondering, okay, how do, how do I co-create experiences of connection like the ones that fill this map and fill this book and fill me without having to walk across America to do it. Because I really don't want to do that again. I mean, it was sweet and everything. It was sweet. But it was exhausting, you know? You know, without wearing a sign on my back that says, let's do it. You know, let's connect. How? How do we, how do we meet each other and encounter each other in more than just a passing way? In more than just a you know, oh. <laughs> way. <laughs> and just last night, um, I had a very interesting experience where when you, when you devote yourself to the practice of listening, as I am trying to do in my own little life, disciple myself to this master teacher that is listening, um, every once in a while, you know, I get thrown a curveball. It's like, whoa, what does listening look like now? You know, so I was just last night was in... Um, this uh, every other weekly meditation circle of young people. Um, and and we, we, we introduced each other, went around the circle, checked in, meditated in, in uh, great equanimity and, and serenity, you know? <laughs> and then this guy walks in, in the middle of the sit, bumping things around and clanking around, you know? And I'm, I'm like, trying to meditate here. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> And we finish the sit, and this guy introduces himself, and it becomes pretty clear he's drunk. He's drunk, you know. And um, you know, he's actually seems to have peed himself. Okay, all right, it's live. You know, I'm I'm the supposed facilitator, co-facilitator of this group, and here's this. Okay, what does listening look like now? You know, I would, he he stepped out of the room. And then someone said, hey, I think this guy is. And then all of a sudden we're talking, you know, what do, what, what do we do? And I said, hey, he's welcome here. Let's, let's bring him in. Listening includes all, you know. And then some other guy was like, I don't feel comfortable or safe with that. Okay, yes. So I go out to meet this man. I, I, I ask him, who are you? How's it going? Are you drunk? <laughs> He says, uh, he looks at me, he goes, yeah. I say, can we, you know, just talk outside for a second? So we step outside, and I say, hey, man, 
You know, and I'm trying, a part of what I'm trying to do in this moment is let you know, I'm here for you. You know, we've got a little bit of a gnarly thing going on right now, but I'm, I'm here for you. This is what I'm trying to communicate. How's it going, man? Who are you? What's, how'd you get here? You know? And he opens. Some of his guards are down, right? The guards that we all have, some of them are down because of the booze. And it's sad to me that, it, that for so many of us, it takes something like that to let the guards down, to show you. And, and here he was coming, you know, coming in his state of inebriation and confusion and suffering to this group, reaching out for something, someone. Because who, who doesn't need solidarity in this most epic experience of being human? And so he was in that, and I was seeing him in that and trying to, hey, and he, he opens up and is talking about his father, you know, and his story. And he goes on. He goes on. As was his right. As, as was my privilege. And, and then he, he petered off, you know. And I said, well, hey, man, I'm, like I say, if it were up to me, if it were just me, we'd be in there. But there are others here. We don't know how they're going to react. So we're out here. But I'm here for you, man. I'm, and there, there's, you know, we can go for a walk down the hall. I mean, I'm just, I'm here. I'm here. And then he, he looked at me. And he looked me right in the eyes. And he says, Why? Why? Why are you here for me? <sighs> yeah. Sometimes that kind of offering of I love you and I'm here for you and I care about you. I don't even know you. I don't need to know you in order to be here for you, in order to support you, in order to set aside all of the things I thought I was going to do tonight to be here for you. Obviously, that's why I'm here. That's why we are here, I would posit. You know, what use, what use is, is our accomplishment? What use is our technology? What use is my book? What use is anything if we don't know how to be here for one another in a moment, especially like that? And that kind of message that I was trying to communicate to him, uh, yeah, is so sadly rare. That kind of attending presence is, is so sadly not taught in this country that when it was received by this man, he, he didn't trust it, you know? Why? And then it was a process of, well, let me tell you why, man. At first, I actually just, you know, I looked him in the eye. And I was like, all right, I'll tell you why. And some words almost came, but then they didn't. And then I did with him what we might have done here at the beginning of this talk if I chose not to speak and just tried to look at all of you. I was going to talk, and then it was just, let me tell you why with this. And there, it, it felt like a, a, his, a pupil, like his, his heart contract, uh, expanding to receive what I was offering or trying to offer and then not, not and then open. And then, and, then he's, he goes, and then he goes, I'm not one for bullshit, man. I said, okay, I'll put it to words. I'll put it to words. So, yeah, one doesn't have to walk across America to listen. <laughs> it's my belief that um, the amount of listening that has to be done in this country today in order to understand each other and ourselves is so great, so, so the, the amount of listening that has to be done is so ridiculously vast that it can't ever be up to one person or 
even one group of professional people, you know, to, to show up. Each one of us, I think, has to commit ourselves to this apprenticeship, to listening, from which there is not a single moment's rest. You know, you're either listening or you're not. And inevitably, it'll be both, right? It's like mindfulness practice. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm here, and then I'm thinking about something else. You know? Yeah, I'll tell one more story, and then maybe we'll have some time for questions. And I um, could tell you a... Um, a walk-in story, but they're all in the book, <laughs> you know? So some of you maybe already have heard them, and it'd be a good excuse to buy the book, support your local bookstore. So I'll tell you another story that happened more recently, vis-a-vis -vis listening. And, and I'm, I'm also aware, I want to do justice to the walking part of this of this presentation and this journey. There's the walking to listen, there's walking and listening, and, and the walking was intense, you know? The walking was crazy. I was walking anywhere from 10 miles a day to, to 40 at one point, you know, through the desert in the middle of the summer, and it was hot and miserable and clarifying, you know? And I walked through the winter down in the south and, yeah, didn't know where I was gonna sleep, and, and, and there were different kinds of walking. There was, there was weep walking, which I told you about. There was bliss walking. There was fury walking. You know, so the, there, there's a lot to the walking. But um, on this particular night, I'm feeling especially inspired by the listening part of, of what I have to offer here through this story. Because I, it's just so needed, I think, in every, everywhere. <laughs> You know, um, and so I'll tell this. I'll this. I'll tell this story in service of that. This um, this happened uh, maybe two years ago now, and I had gone back to my old high school, um, sort of in in pursuit of this question of how how do I continue to to connect with people in the deep ways that I was while on this walk, you know. And one one thing I wanted to try out was going to this high school and see. Just let's see what would happen if we go walking to listen for four hours in Middletown, Delaware. You know, I went to a boarding school, so there's very much of a bubble over here. And then what happens if we just get dropped into town and did nothing but walk to listen? Four hours. Go. So I said, hey, any takers? You know, we got, we're going to do this walking to listen thing. You'll find a question, and we'll go into town, and, and we'll walk and listen. And anybody want to give me your one free day of the week? And uh, we'll go do this. And three brave souls. I guess I'll do it. I have no idea what you're talking about, but okay. <laughs> sweet, sweet ones. And so we conspired together, and they found their questions. The sincere question that was going to be the vehicle, the engine, for the next four hours for them. The catalyst for the conversation. All it takes is a sincere to enter into that world of deep connection. And those questions are hard to ask. I've been to high schools now several times where I ask students to find such a question and then to go out and walk amongst each other and ask each other their questions. And they won't do it because it can be scary to ask a question that you actually care about because it might reveal something of you. Yeah, so once I had them write down their questions anonymously, put it in the circle, and then we spread it out again. And the questions that came out, you know, how do you, how do you put together a broken family? Yeah. Who has the audacity to ask that kind of a question? But the moment you do is the moment you begin building that bridge into the world that listening makes possible. So we go out, these three students and I, we get dropped in the middle of this town that I had never actually been in before, although I lived in that area for four years. And 
it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that as white people, we stood out here. It seemed to be a neighborhood where mostly black people are living and people of color. And I'm experiencing in myself this feeling of, whoa, I don't belong here. I'm an outsider here. What am I doing here? This is crazy. And simultaneously, that longing to connect that, no, I know something is possible here with this willingness and ability to listen. And let's find out. Let's find out, you know? So we keep walking, you know, and we're just like, all right. <laughs> just waiting for someone to, you know, is it you? No? Okay. And at one point, this guy on the other side of the street sees us. And he's this big brown man. And he's got a paper bag with a beer bottle, beer can in it, cigarette. And he's, he's a good bit taller than me. He's like looking out at us. And I, I sort of make eye contact with him and I go, <laughs> just reaching out, you know, over the chasm of this street and everything that was keeping us apart. And he goes, hey. <laughs> and I go, hey, so I'm still across the street. Hey, so we're, um, we're from the high school and we're out here walking to listen. Okay, so just walking to listen. And each one of us has a question. And we, we would love it if um, we could ask you our questions. You know, I'm, and I'm hearing how ridiculous I sound, okay? You know, I'm just like, and, and again, that's part of the cost. It's like, all right, it's, I'm going to sound ridiculous. But I know something is possible here, and I don't care. I'll, I'll be a clown, okay? I'll, I'll do what I got to do to get there. And maybe we won't get there, but I'm going to try. <laughs> and he, I said, we just want to ask you our question. Can we ask you our question? He goes, depends on what kind of questions they are. <laughs> you know, that same, why? Why? So, okay, okay. So we cross the street. And we gather around him. And it was a young woman and two young men. And the young woman, brave soul, stepped forward and she goes, well, my question is, um, is about happiness. What is happiness? I, I feel like I used to know what happiness is, but I've gotten to a point where I, I, I don't know what it is anymore. And so my question is, what is happiness? <laughs> and this man, it looked as if he had been transported into another world, you know? Wait, wait, whoa, 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 what is happiness? This is the question you're going to entrust to me? You're going to ask me that question? As if I've lived something worthy enough that might answer your most sincere and heartfelt longing for an answer? You're going to, you're going to, you see me that way? As your, as your teacher, your cousin, your asking me a question that you would ask your, yes, yeah, spiritual advisor, or your professor. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, okay. Happiness, happiness, happiness. What is happiness? And he dove into this question. Just moments before, he was, what kind of questions you got? And then, all right, let me tell you about happiness. And he got his two kids bicycling around us. And he goes, this is my happiness. This. And he tells us about his kids. And then he tells us the story about how he was imprisoned for several years. And for two of those years, he didn't get to see his kids. Not, not a once. Until one day, he got a visitation. And he didn't know who it was. And he's sitting with his back to the door. And someone comes into the door. And he hears the voices of his children, his happiness. You can imagine, leaps up, overcome, rushing out to go embrace his happiness, and then it's tackled to the ground because no physical contact is allowed in such visitation. And is then put into solitary confinement for such an offense. 
and our hearts are, even now, my breaking, opening, connecting, and he's going in, and he's singing a song, the kind of song that can only come out if asked for, if listened to in the presence of a trustworthy listener, someone who wants to know and is ready to put themselves aside for a moment to find out. So he's schooling us, enlightening us, And he sort of comes out into the end of his answer, kind of flustered almost. He's like, what just happened? And he goes, you, what's your question? Come on, let's do more of this. <laughs> you know, let's, let's go. This is cool. I like it here. <laughs> Me too. So the young man, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be myself because I'm applying to college and I'm supposed to know and I'm supposed to write these essays about who I am, but I don't know. So my question is, how do you know yourself? And the guy, <laughs> you can imagine, dove into it again. And an hour goes by. And then the van came and picked us up. <laughs> Such a strange, abrupt... Ah, okay, I guess it's over now, you know? But it's right there. It's, 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 it's right there. It's one sincere question away. A moment's willingness to hush and listen and learn what it means to listen. It's so close. And it's, it's here even now. And, um, and I thank you for listening, those of you who are. <laughs> and thank you to those of you who aren't. I appreciate you too. <laughs> Andrew, can you, can you hear me? Okay, well, it was inspiring to me, and I'm sure to the audience. Uh, does anybody have any questions that they would like to put forward? Got one up there. Okay. It's on. It's on. The question I have is, was a religion any part of your early life? Was religion a part of my was, early life? Was a religion, a religion. any yeah. part of your early life? Yeah. Um, I was raised loose, loosely in the Catholic tradition. Um, and then that sort of faded away a bit. But I have that as a foundation. And my father is a professor of Buddhism. And my mother is a, a teacher and practitioner of yoga and meditation. So I, I, I had a an interesting melting pot of traditions and perspectives. But I will say that um, this introduced me to spirituality in a, in a way that um, I hadn't thought of it before. You know, spirituality as the practice of learning what it is to be human, learning to encounter all of those pieces and voices inside, and just finding out what happens from there. It's learning to see God in each and every faith and to trust that no part is excluded. You know, God wouldn't exclude, so who am I to? You know, so learning to see in the way that God might, and inevitably failing, you know, but doing, doing my best here and now, not somewhere out there then. Right now, right here. Thank you. So I uh, loosely described you started this trying to find yourself. Yeah. So now, five years later, six years later, um, where do you see yourself on that journey? Uh -huh. And um, 
do you think that this has been um, a productive way to go about doing that? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, when I, when I got to the ocean, it was like, it was done. I like, I, I found myself, you know, it's like, <laughs> done. Good, you know, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I so appreciate that question. Um, yeah, I think, I think I realized somewhere in the desert, in the middle of summer, waiting for this Forrest Gumpian moment of, <laughs> I found it. Yeah, I'll just go home now. I sort of realized, oh, okay, this is an ongoing process. You know, myself is an ongoing process. It's not, there's not some, some thing inside here that I get to touch and meet and, oh, that's it. It's no, I, as conditions change and wash over me, I get to learn about who I am as I respond in those moments, you know? And so, I'm constantly learning about who I am, I'm constantly finding, finding myself um, in a moment like last night, uh, finding what I'm capable of in, in sort of magnanimous ways, finding out what I'm capable of in, you know, not so magnanimous ways. You know, my, I can thank my partnership for that. God bless Anna. You know, you know. The, 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 a quick question. How many shoes did you <laughs> wear out? Five shoes. I, two boots and three hiking sandals. Yeah. I wanted to ask, did you never have anyone listen to you? Mm. Mm. Yes. Did, did, did I ever find anyone listen to me? Yeah. Um, there, there were uh, uh, a few people who did, very intention, intentionally. Um, but what I found and what I continue to find is the one who is willing and able to listen deeply is rare indeed. And I am blessed to have such people in my life, people who um, are fluent in the language of listening, who have studied well and practiced and can speak it, which is to say, not speak. And, you know, not that listening is some comatose, glaze-eyed, just, okay, I'm just going to... No, it's a very active, engaging... You know, so I, I do have people who, who listen to me in my life. And on this journey, I think actually a big part of, of uh, the gift that I was given was being attended to deeply. So may, maybe, not, maybe the way I was listened to wasn't necessarily me telling my stories to people, but the, just the very fact that people took me into their homes. Three out of four nights I spent underneath a roof of some kind. People's homes, general stores, fire stations. So people listening to me in this way, saying, you're, you're welcome here. You know? So yes, I guess. Most definitely. Thank you. Okay, right here. How did you finance this journey? Did you have jobs along the way? Or mm -hmm. a sponsor yeah. that... Yeah, so I... Um, so I had the lobster boat. I made three or four grand off that. And um, that was my budget, three to four grand. And we're gonna, I was going to walk until I ran out of money or until I had that Forrest Gump experience <laughs> or until I got to the ocean, whichever came first. And with the way that people showed up to me and for me, I ended up spending less than $1,000 over the course of an entire year of living, all costs included. Less than $1,000 because of people giving me food and lodging and money. I never asked for money. Never asked. People giving me. Yeah. Over here. So, Andrew. Yeah. Yes. Did you read on your journey? And if so, what? Yeah. Well, it reminds me of a... Uh, of a man named Big George in Louisiana on the bayou who put me up one night. Um, he let me sleep underneath his trailer. And um, the next morning he was wishing me well and sending me off. And he said, you know, 
keep an open mind and, and remember that really all you're doing is reading a book just with your feet. <laughs> and it was true. So to your question, I actually didn't read a whole lot over the course of that year because I was reading all the time with my feet, my ears, my heart. And it was work, to, certainly to walk, and most certainly to listen. And so by the time I would get to bed, it was just... <laughs> but I did have three poets with me. I had Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass. I had Rainier Maria Rilke, Letters to a Young Poet. And Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. And three uh, fabulous, trustworthy guides are they. Question. I have a question. Did you go to St. Andrew's School for one? I did. And number two is, okay, outside of a therapeutic listening situation, yeah. and you're in your normal friendship circles, how do you switch? What are your clues for switching? Mm. Okay, I'm really listening to you now. Yeah. Because, you know, in normal life, people establish a certain way of listening to one another. How do you switch that mm. to mm. authentic? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because I don't want to be lying to you. You know, I don't, I, as a listener, I, I don't want to be pretending to be doing something that I'm not, which speaks to the last part of your question. How do you stay authentic as a listener? For me, it's just, yeah, it's listening to myself and what I'm capable of in that moment. And, and if, if I need space, it means taking space. If it means I can't listen anymore, it means being honest about that. Um, and it also involves questioning why I might need space and if that's actually something I need or if it's actually um, something I'm avoiding, you know. And so it's just, a, it's just a practice of mindfulness. Yeah, constantly listening first to what's going on in here. Yeah, over here. Maybe one, maybe one more question to honor the work our bodies are doing right now. Oh, One last question. My, okay. question. my question's not on that, but I was curious if you had electronic devices with you to call home, to record people, your thoughts. Yeah. I had a flip phone. I, did not, I didn't want a smartphone. I didn't want to be connected uh, on the internet out there because I figured I would just follow the, the blue dot all the way across America if I did. I'm not disciplined enough, you know, but I got rid of it. But I did have a flip phone, and I texted my mom every night called her often, um, and I had, a, I had an L Olympus LS10 audio recorder with which I recorded lots of conversations. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I guess uh, that's about it. Thank you.